Yeah, we seem to be recording. Oh. No. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So I mean, no one has logged on yet. I, I think we can maybe wait a couple of minutes and uh, mm-hmm. see how this goes. If, and we can make a decision whether we want to talk amongst ourselves for for forty five minutes or or do what, however we want to proceed. But. Uh, well, I mean, I think that we should stay on because I mean, in my past experience, people sort yeah. of come in and out. And there was the session with the um, Ukrainian um, panel, like yeah. that started at, at uh, five of nine, and that ends at mm-hmm. nine thirty. So yeah, so lots of people goes, like, a few minutes right? over, then people will join afterwards. I That's great. That's great. I think so. We will hang on. I think we can wait for another maybe three minutes. Sure. Yeah. yeah. That makes sense to me. I think that, um, yeah, very, very flexible here, I think. All right. So to anyone who is joined now, we, uh, we know that there was a very interesting plenary session that just occurred. So we're going to give it a couple more minutes for people to, um, uh, take their bio breaks and make it from, uh, from the plenary to the breakout sessions, but we uh, appreciate your patience. So we'll start in about two minutes. And Joe, I just got the note saying that my network is not stable. So I, th- I think it is. I, I get that from time to time. I think as long as I'm not opening a bunch of windows, it will be a okay. Okay. <laughs> mm-hmm. Again, to anyone who's just uh, coming to the room, we, we, we will start here in about one minute. We just wanted to make sure we left plenty of time for people to make their way from plenary to the breakout sessions. All right, well, I, th- I think we should just go ahead and get started. Uh, we're five minutes past uh, the start of the session. We'll hope that people join um, as we go along. We've got about 40 minutes to get through what is a pretty uh, pretty interesting topic about uh, geopolitics and U.S. companies. I think probably the conversation today will go beyond U.S. companies, but given that this is a session about uh, the United States, it, it makes sense that we start there. Um, you know, when, when Frank first uh, designed the session, uh, it was about COVID and some of the 
geopolitical disruptions that would come from pandemics, geopolitical competition. I think, you know, uh, as the events of the last eight days have shown, eight, nine days, there are plenty of geopolitical risks that we have to think about and that companies have to deal with and start to consider more prominently into their strategic and operational decision making. And so we have a, a really outstanding panel uh, here today to talk about those risks and how to cope with them and also what companies can do to sort of um, potentially dampen some of the um, geopolitical uncertainty. So, you know, what I thought we could do is just each participant that we have on the call here today introduce themselves and then talk for five, seven minutes or so. I you know, don't want to make it into a into to three long speeches, but certainly enough to, to set the groundwork for what the key issues are that companies should be thinking about, U.S. companies and others, as they look at a, a world of uncertainty um, and uh, complexity. So, so Joe, I, I'll start with you because you're up at 2.30 in the morning, so I want to make sure we get your, your input here as quickly as possible. Uh, so we'll go, uh, Joe, then Mamuka, and then Pascal will we'll let you uh, back clean up in the American parlance and uh, take us to the question and answer. So, Joe, go ahead. Please offer your perspectives on what is a really interesting and, and very salient topic. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> well, you know, the, the, the events, as you say, of the last seven days have changed people's perspectives quite a lot. But I think they're simple. I see them as simply a another step in a process that has been going on since essentially 2001. Um, you know, since 9-11, the world started to change. Um, and, you know, it continued to change uh, very dramatically. Um, and maybe this, you know, very tragic events in Ukraine are the slap in the face that we all needed to realize that the world has indeed changed. So, so why has it changed? Well, you know, throughout the late 80s, the 80s and 90s, and certainly after the fall of the Soviet Union, um, <clears throat> we believed that the battle of political ideas was over. We believed that the West had won liberal democracy was going to spread like wildfire everywhere and there was really nothing nothing more left to discuss politically so the window of political debate uh, was very narrow uh, as a result we could get on with the process of focusing on economics and commerce uh, we could globalize, we could all be friends together because there was not much you know, to discuss politically. And we could focus, business could focus on the business of making money. Uh, <clears throat> well, that's all changed. Um, I mean, if in the early 80s, somebody would have said to any of us that the world's largest economy, the world's second largest economy uh, by, the, by 2022, would be an authoritarian state, nobody would have believed it. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, the, the world has changed very dramatically. And the days when we could simply, the battle for political ideas is back. And increasingly, they will take priority over economic and commercial considerations. So, for businesses, I think, I, I you know, it depends what you mean by geopolitical risk. Of course, there is always uncertainty, but I think there are now new certainties which are different from the old certainties. And the new certainties are that our 20th, late 20th century conception of globalization is well past its sell-by date. That's over. Uh, it's not going to come back. Um, this idea of crisscrossing global supply chains, of sharing technology with everybody, of, you know, foreign direct investment going anywhere. And, you know, let's be clear, for it's foreign direct investment that has made Putin wealthy and that has created a geostrategic rival in, chi rival in China. Um, so, you know, people have to take some responsibility for that. But nobody considered those things. Mm. <laughs> um, 
you know, the idea that, you know, we can live, you know, that we're all going to live in some kind of 1960s kumbaya loving forever has been shattered in the last, uh, in the last week or so, but it's been coming for a long time. So when I think about geopolitical risk, I think, and, 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 and I, I think of two things. One is I think about uncertainty. And of course, the future is always uncertain. But I believe it's uncertain in its detail. It's not uncertain in its direction. I think the direction of travel is pretty clear. Um, and, and then I think of risk. Uh, and to me, risk arises when corporations stick to world views that are outdated. Mm. Um, I think that you lower your risk by being realistic about the real politic of the world today. Um, and it involves, you know, a lot of difficulties because it involves abandoning a lot of things on which businesses were built it involves abandoning certain world views that we'd come to take for granted. Um, but, you know, and it's a slow process to rebuild business models. Uh, but it has to happen <laughs> because the world has changed. So I think for those businesses that accept that the world has changed, that uh, manage to build within them um, ways of realistically assessing the direction of travel and then slowly and painstakingly altering their business models to the new realities. Um, I think that, you know, you know, the world always changes. Sure. Um, and the people who succeed are the ones who can adapt to that. Um, so I think adaptation is possible. I don't see any reason why businesses should not continue to be successful uh, if they adapt. Uh, but as always, the businesses who that will not be so successful are the ones who cling to, you know, to the way they've done things in the past when the sure. world has changed. So Sorry. I'll stop there. No, thank you. The, the great introductory comments, and uh, I think a, a great uh, way to set the conversation here. Muka, I think we'll turn to you now. You were very close to the events that are coming on, both geographically and geopolitically, and uh, it'd be great to get your perspectives on uh, where we are and what this means for businesses. Yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, so before I will address the major topic, of course, I would like uh, to express my full support to the uh, people of uh, Ukraine and the bravery of Ukrainian people is mm. really breathtaking. And and I think that today the Ukraine uh, has become a war field, a point of clash between the free world and the tyranny. And everybody who believes in the values of free world should be the supporters of, of Ukrainian people. Uh, unfortunately, my country, Georgia, uh, was the first victim of the Russian aggression. And uh, back then, we were not heard. As a result, 20% of our territory is now occupied. And because we were not heard back then, I think that now uh, everybody is uh, paying a higher price. So <clears throat> when it comes to the uh, interests of American companies and how can they hedge their risks and political and geopolitical risks in this part of the world is a, is a very interesting topic. Um, uh, so when, uh, to, when I took a break from politics, uh, um, uh, together with my American and Georgian friends, I started a new organization, American Georgia Economic Cooperation Foundation. And uh, basic, basically, uh, we have two major goals. Uh, the first one is to uh, facilitate to the uh, negotiations about free trade agreement uh, between two countries. And the second goal is to uh, establish, to try uh, and uh, establish a regional office of a, uh, of a development finance corporation in Georgia. 
and uh, this is actually directly related to the topic of today's discussion uh, because uh, Development Finance Corporation, DFC, um, has a very interesting tool in their toolkit um, uh, how American companies ha can hedge their uh, geopolitical risks. So if you look at the statistics for the last 15 uh, years, unfortunately, the amount of FDI is significantly decreasing, both in Central Asia as well as in, in South Caucasia. And um, there are a number of reasons for this. And uh, one of the major reasons from our perspective is, is that um, American companies, they don't have enough uh, capacities or tools uh, to to hedge the the political risks, um, and this is the reason why they cannot uh, compete fully with their Asian and the Russian competitors. Um, so basically, uh, one of the goals of, of our organization is to to try to uh, to create this regional office in Georgia and basically. Uh, this will help uh, entire region to attract more American company, more American companies, and uh, more FDIs. So basically, we are talking about eight countries. Uh, so five countries from from Central Asia: Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, uh, Tajikistan, Turkmenistan, and Kyrgyzstan, and uh, three countries from South Caucasia: Georgia, uh, Armenia, and Azerbaijan. So this is the fastest growing consumer market in the world. You know that the Central Asia as well as South Asia is, is very rich by uh, mineral resources, but um, unfortunately we have this uh, sustainable negative trend of uh, FDI coming from the US as well as actually from the European uh, Union as well. So uh, we are trying not to be focused only on problems, but on solutions as well. And we, we believe that uh, having the regional office of DFC in Georgia uh, covering the region can be a game changer in this respect. Great. Well, thank, thanks so much. And I, I think this starts to get to what companies can do to hedge that risk, which is a really obviously a central question to our panel today. Pascal, I, I think um, it would be great to hear your perspective on this and thinking about what's next after <laughs> both, both in terms of what what's next in Ukraine and then other potential challenges facing um, businesses in the United States. Sure. Uh, thank you. Um, so I'm Pascal Siegel. I, I work, I'm a managing director at Anchor Eye Consulting, uh, where we advise companies on geopolitical risk. And um, my area of focus in, in general is, um, is Europe. So yes, this past week has been uh, pretty busy. Um, look, the, the world, Joe is right, the, the world is changing. We are not in the unipolar world of the 90s and multilateral, you know, love fest, democracy is winning it all and, and all that. But most corporations, at least the ones that are big enough to think about geopolitical risk, Still live, still live in this mindset. Um, and that translates into geopolit geopolitical risk being a sort of um, afterthought. So they have some little boxes here and there. You know, there is the finance hedging piece, uh, you know, for forex uh, risk. Um, there is the compliance risk in legal and you know that's the way we used to do business and it worked so that's the way that we're still doing business um, understanding geopolitical risk beyond its quanti quantifiable aspects you know that you can put in a spreadsheet and present to your board is is still sort of foreign hmm. um, to companies. I, I would say that the, maybe the sectorally, the only exception might be oil and gas, um, yeah. you know, for obvious reasons. But the in the rest of the corporate, of the American corporate world, there is really um, a lack of um, systemic 
thinking about geopolitical risk and how all the geopolitical risks are interconnected and how something that happens in Ukraine today might affect your market position in China or in India tomorrow. Mm -hmm. And that's this new level of, you know, pretty much... It's a kind of systems thinking. You, you have to think of geopolitical risk as an engineering system. Hmm. Right? Um, and that's that level of thinking that is uh, still missing in, in most American companies. You know, I, I like that analogy, the systems engineering. I, I know I mentioned on our rehearsal call, call an example of... Um, the three biggest U.S. airline carriers being shut out for a period of time of, of doing business in China because they, on their websites, had um, references to Taipei, Taiwan, in terms of if you booked to Taipei Airport. And, of course, the People's Republic of the Chinese Communist Party didn't appreciate that. I mean, that, that seems such an incidental thing, and yet it has huge consequences. And, and similar, there are similar examples in other businesses. So how do businesses create a culture where geopolitical risk becomes a more prominent focus. I mean, they're, they're interested in the bottom line. They want to hear about geopolitical risk, but it, it seems to me that so frequently it's what's the risk of conflict or sanctions or some great big thing happening. Hmm. But we're now in an era of competition in which very small things matter. So I don't know. I, I, I would love to hear some perspectives and, and maybe and we'll go back around. Joe, we'll get you involved in on the start this and, and just what, how do you create that culture? How do you create that sense of organizational focus? Well, I, I mean, I, as, I, as I mentioned earlier, I think the first step is a recognition mm. that the world has changed. I mean, the latest book that I've just published is called The New Political Capitalism. Mm. And I think we're, you know, capitalism has been resilient because it has changed with the times. Uh, you know, we've had, you know, Mercantilist capitalism, industrial capitalism, consumer capitalism, financial, it, it's changed with the ages. And we're now in, in entering a new era where political considerations, not just, you know, at the top level, what we're discussing here are, are geopolitical risks, but, but political considerations for businesses go these days top to bottom in a business, mm. you know, from diversity questions to environmental politics to you know even everyday operational issues like do we have gender neutral bathrooms you know in, you know to to you know google employees uh, protesting and stopping google taking a 10 billion contract with the department of defense you know that political issues are now all pervasive uh, in how companies need to do business, mm -hmm. and they haven't been. So yeah. it's it's right. not un, it's not unreasonable that that most corporations haven't yet built the skills and capabilities to deal with these things. Sure. Um, but as these things become, as as political issues continue to become much more pervasive, then it's. You need to, you know, it, it's a, it starts from the top. Um, I mean, you know, H, a company like HSBC, which is, which is, uh, you know, a bank that's exposed to substantial geopolitical risk as a British bank uh, with most of its profits coming out of China. Mm. I was reading a comment somewhere that, you know, 80% or 90% of the chairman's job is politics now. It's not, it's not running the business. Um, and I suggest that this is becoming true of many corporations. I mean, in my book, I describe Facebook, now Meta, as essentially a political corporation, not a technology company, because nobody gives a damn about, what, about its technology. What we all care about is its impact on our societies. Mm -hmm. And they've kind of recognized that by promoting Nick, Nick Clegg to be at the same level as the CEO and the COO, um, as president of global affairs, 
recognizing, it seems to me, and I've just been in correspondence with it today, recognizing that you know, the political aspects of that cooperation are just as important as everything else. Yeah. So, so, you know, once you have the recognition in place, then building what I call these political antennae into a corporation is perfectly doable. Um, yeah. You know, uh, yeah. it's just being willing to move in that direction. Right. Uh, Mamuka, a couple of minutes on, uh, or take some time to uh, expound upon, you know, how these companies uh, shift their organizational culture to respond to a, a very sensitive, uh, almost every decision is a big decision in some ways, politically and geopolitically. Um, yes, yeah, so I would agree with uh, Joe's argument. Uh, so the the first step is always in re- uh, recognition, right? Mm-hmm. So uh, um, so in when it comes to our region, so uh, when was the last time that you heard the positive news about about our region, right? So basically, the perception in the business community is that yes, this. Uh, region is very interesting from business perspective, but there are geopolitical risks, right? Especially because of our uh, northern neighbor, right? So, uh, and and uh, and therefore, it, it is very important actually for for all, all all the countries in the in the in the region uh, to have a very concrete message. When the American perspective investor is asking this question, okay, mm-hmm. how how can I, how my company can hedge the geopolitical risks? So, uh, uh, when I was a prime prime minister, I was getting these uh, questions uh, pretty pretty frequently, and uh, uh, so that was the reason why. Uh, together with my friends, we were, we were trying our best to identify when I left the politics how we can address this uh, issue because I think that this is the biggest barrier for this part of the world to be better integrated into the global economy uh, because potentially uh, this region has enormous resources to become the the biggest driver of the of the economy grows on this continent, but this is a barrier, how to attract the uh, FDI from American companies as well as from European companies. Mm. So uh, basically, I think that this is the best way uh, to approach, uh, to have such solid organizations as DFC uh, doing the business on the ground and providing such tools, uh, financial tools to the prospective investors. Okay, mm. uh, and um, mm, so if if the companies uh, have the information, have the feeling that there are concrete tools, how can they mitigate uh, such geopolitical risks? I'm sure that as a region, we will be able to significantly increase uh, the amount of FDI from the uh, United States. Um, uh, that's point number one. Point number two. Uh, so uh, many people are asking, so why Asian and Russian companies are successful and so active, uh, but not American and European companies? And the answer to this question is that, uh, and we have to be honest here that, and direct to the business community that Russian and Asian companies, they get uh, direct or indirect support from the state to be successful and active. Uh, mm. is part of the world. So uh, so I think that uh, having a concrete mechanism uh, in providing the tools for the American companies to hedge the geopolitical risks um, uh, in this part of the world will be will be really a, a game changer for the years to come. Um, I, mm, I had uh, many meet- meetings with the political leaders leaders of of all these countries, and uh, all of them are very optimistic that uh, having these concrete tools uh, will be will be really a game changer for all of us. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thanks for that. And Pascal, over to you. 
So, um, so I think there are a couple of things that companies can do, but it requires a change in mentality. Yeah. Um, the companies need to need to have a function for chief geopolitical officer, right? It can be it can be the CEO, it can be under but close to the CEO, but it needs. I mean, there needs to be a point person that is able to um, bring together all the different elements of uh, geopolitical risk into a coherent strategy. And mitigating geopolitical risk is not just a function of, oh, you know, reading the newspapers, reading a few, you know, think tanky piece. Um, and, uh, oh, yes, getting an idea of how things are done in X, Y, or Z country. Um, it's not just about, oh, I have to comply with this in, the, in this market and that in this other market. Um, it's about how the world functions, impacts all of the function of your business. Yeah, so it's about scenario planning. Um, it's about uh, futures, um, and yeah, and how all these impact your development, commercial, your commercial development, your market, uh, you know, uh, market entry strategies, your development, etc. Um, so it's you know raising the function. And using the tools that are available, you know, in, I mean, in geopolitical yeah. practices. You know, as, a, as someone who spent um, the last quarter century doing scenario planning and tabletop exercises and war gaming, it does my heart good to hear scenario planning being mentioned <laughs> because I agree. I think it's a it's an incredibly valuable tool to incorporate uncertainty rather than try to eliminate it. And I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off there, Pascal. No, no, I mean, it's, so this is one thing that, um, you know, we do at, um, at Ankara is trying to explain, trying to model for company what the future might look like and have them um, look at their own business strategy or market entry strategy and say, oh, look, you have all your eggs in the best case scenario basket. Right. Right. Does this make sense? Yeah. Right. And that's, I mean, I think that that's a new, for many companies, that's really a new education. Sure. And, and yes, it's, <laughs> it's a little, it's difficult. Sure, or, or organizational change can but it's be. A, I mean, it's definitely a needed transition. Yeah. Sure. Well, I know that Daniel, who is uh, listening in, uh, had some some thoughts or a question. Daniel, do you want to do you want to jump in? Um, let me give you the mic. Uh, yeah, go ahead. If can you jump in here, Daniel? Oh, wow. Usually it takes the mic of uh, 20 seconds. This time it went quickly. When you want the <laughs> mic. <laughs> Thank you, guys. I just want to say I am an American who works in Central Asia. Uh, uh, although I'm coming to you from New York, I'm probably returning to Central Asia in a, in, a, in a few months. But I love this panel because I'm a geopolitical nerd. So I eat this stuff up and uh, it's been really great. And I also agree with Pascal's uh, point there. That's a great point that you can have a chief geopolitical officer. I think you're right. I think that's something now that people are going to have to start to really uh, look into because something happens in one part of the world that you may not even deal with, but it affects lots of things that happen somewhere else now. Uh, and especially with this deglobalization somewhat and this uh, the supply chain kind of uh, breaking up a bit, you know, a lot of what's happening one place is going to affect somewhere else uh, a lot. So that's that's definitely something. Uh, one thing I, I can say uh, from Mamuka, because I'm really interested in what he's doing uh, and bringing American business and investment to the region, because I see myself, too, 
that American companies don't get the support from the state. I know we don't have that mentality. We're not a, you know, government shouldn't support, but, but you see that uh, from other countries, there's tremendous uh, uh, state support for some of these, uh, for some of the things that they're doing. And that's why I'm very excited. You mentioned the DFC. I've been very critical of lack of American support for for the region. I mean, um, I you may want to mention this thing about uh, is that is it the Blue Dot Network? Am I getting it right? Mm -hmm. uh, yes, I Blue think Dot. that's going to compete with China and with other things. I think that's a very uh, interesting thing. And maybe w just one last point I'll mention that I've seen at least in Central Asia. You know, they were cut off from the world for so many years. And sometimes there's a lack of understanding of the, it's changing now because a lot more younger people are coming into government and into companies, but maybe of the way the world works. And sometimes when a country opens up, there's this expectation, they don't have to do anything. How come the investment isn't coming in? That's what we hear. How come the investment isn't coming in? We opened up. Well, there's a hundred companies, there's a hundred countries that have better ratings than you on every indicator. You have to do, you can't just open up sometimes just expected. And the other thing that is interesting is, you know, you'll get, they call them Hakims. They're basically mayors or regional, um, or, or, or regional governors, or, you know, even people in government, it's, it's happening less and less, but they'll come to an investor and they'll say, you know what, come invest here. I'm here. I can protect you. You know what I mean? And they don't understand. That's the last thing the investor wants to hear. The investors can say, well, listen, first of all, you could change your mind tomorrow. And number two, you could be gone tomorrow. What about the rule of law? What about this? And so there's sometimes a mismatch between what the locals are thinking that the world thinks and, and the opposite. So I think that, uh, investor training investor relations training you know for some of them would be great too so those are just some of my points but i would just be very interested to hear what you think about this dfc how this can hedge this blue dot network what you think about it how you think it can compete do you think it's realistic any of you uh yeah. generally that's that's my big that's great Dan daniel thanks so much that that was really really great and i'm mean, we'll start with you thank you daniel uh, yeah uh, i think that uh, daniel made him great point. just just to, just so we're aware sorry to interrupt yeah. we've got about sure. seven minutes and i'd like okay. to get everyone an opportunity so, to talk uh, here in the i'll try minutes. to be very brief so very i think quick. that uh, uh daniel made a great point especially when it comes to kind of the m m mentality so we shouldn't have an illusion nobody's asking for the uh for the u.s government to subsidy right. to provide some subsidy for the american company to enter the market either in central asia or in uh south caucasia but it's like kind of a having an insurance to buy an insurance, right? So uh, any company who is kind of doing uh, the business over overseas or even 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 locally, so uh, it's a it's a usual way to do the business and to do, to manage a business to have the insurance, right? To buy the in insurance to hedge and to mitigate some risks of getting your a business operation disrupted. So I think that we should look from, from this angle. But of course, that does not mean that the local governments should not have an ambitious uh, kind of agenda to try to push the competitiveness of their uh, states to another level. Okay, it's when it comes to rule of law, when it comes to the uh, human resources development, uh education and and healthcare and and many uh other fields um but uh th this usually means that the the state and the government need some time okay to conduct the structural reforms but the businesses in this case the american businesses they need the solutions now how can they mitigate the geopolitical risks in this part of the world okay and, and i think that we we have the solution to this Thank you. Pascal, I'll turn it to you to respond to any of Daniel's comments or any other thoughts that you think that we should take away from this conversation. Well, I was, you know, to, to your question about Blue Dot or um, 
you know, the European counter initiatives right, right. Um, to BRI, uh, I mean, Global Gateway or Africa Gateway, um, you know, it's, yeah, I mean, these are, these are good initiatives, um, but there are so many good initiatives that didn't pan out or that, you know, get delayed or bucked down or, um, you know, BRI has um, a few strides, you know, is a few strides in, in advance of any of these. Um, so I would not necessarily hang my hat on, um, you know, any one of them being, you know, becoming a real competitor to, to, BR, to BRI. I think that BRI could overextend itself. Um, you know, that's uh, definitely um, a possibility. Um, on, um, I wanted to say, I mean, you know, with as far as um, you know, the business model, the competition, the the unlevel competition from from Russia or from Chinese companies. Um, I think that the West generally suffers from a lack of innovation in business models. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, to compare us to what the Chinese do, and maybe, you know, the Chinese are leaving their, you know, what, what we went through in the early 20th century, um, so little more free willing, you know, fewer regulations and, and all that. Um, but our business schools teach essentially one way of doing things. Fully agree. Um, well, no, uh, you know, I didn't go to business school. So I did. So I know. <laughs> it's for this, it's for this. But my, my impression is that we, we teach one way you know, yeah. the best way, the most cost-effective way. Um, but we are now in a world of um, where our populations, you know, not just ours in the West, but also in the rest of the world, are demanding stakeholder capitalism. Mm. This has to be invented we need to we need to think about we need to think and implement new business models that can compete on that level yeah. and if we don't if we don't do it um i think we'll be in big trouble yeah thank you thank you for that i think that's a, a fantastic point and, and joe we we started with you because you had the um privileged position of being awake at the least reasonable hour of the morning and so we will end with you uh i just uh you know a couple of minutes here to uh to talk to us a little bit about your final thoughts and, and any responses to daniel's excellent comments yeah i mean some fantastic responses i think in this okay. conversation which i enjoyed very much mm -hmm. um <clears throat> i think that you know the, the only thing i would add to all of the great things that have been said is that we also need to get a little bit further than thinking of geopolitical risk in financial terms, mm. in terms of, you know, how much money am I going to put in and, you know, what, what can I insure against it and all this? Can I hedge against it? Because a lot of the risks now are not the risks. Uh, the world is going to become balkanized. And, and you know, the, the there are higher level questions that one needs to ask when one's saying, do I want to get into a particular part of the world? Um, you know, what is, what is going to be the relationship um, of different parts of the world going forward? Um, so, you know, so do I want to get somewhere, get, get into somewhere that has a certain, mm. that might be aligned with a different block? So I think there are, apart from this kind of, I'm putting money and how do I hedge against it? There's, I think, a broader level question that needs to be asked. And as countries like Georgia and others try to attract foreign direct investment, I think these questions of, of countries are going to be asked you know, even more. 
it's not simply a question of are you going to insure against if something falls apart. It's a question of where are you going politically? Yeah. Um, what what you know what, what what's your political direction and how much control do you have over that yourself as opposed to your neighbours? So I think attracting foreign direct investment these days is not as simple as it used to be. Um, I think there are sort of much broader questions that need to be asked and answered uh, beyond the, the, the kind of... It's a great the things, point. The things beyond the things that can be put on a spreadsheet. Yeah, it's, it's one of many great points made in the last 45 minutes, and I am uh, enormously grateful to have an opportunity to uh, participated and moderated in this and listened into it. So thank you to all of our panelists. This was fantastic. And um, I, uh, I hope we're all able to keep in touch. And uh, thank you for your contributions. It's one minute past our allotted time. So uh, I feel like that's a successful conclusion as well <laughs> to have ended up essentially right on uh, on the mark. So thanks, everyone. Enjoy the rest of your evening, morning, wherever you are. And uh, again, thanks for everyone taking the time. At, uh, I know it's interesting in some places, but this has been this has been really educational for me, and I hope it's been uh, of, of value to you. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank you. Thank you very Have much. Thanks all. Bye bye, everyone. Bye.